Welcome to Growth Minds. Whether it's your first time here or you've been here before, I'm curious to know what it is that brought you here. And if you can, smash that like button below. It really helps spread our message to more people. All right, on to the episode. I think it's kind of timely to to have you on here as I'm as we just were talking off air that I just moved to Lisbon and uh, trying to learn Portuguese. <laughs> and, <laughs> despite my best efforts, it's a bit tricky. Um, I don't know how your Portuguese was when you were visiting down here. You said you've been here a few times. My, my Portuguese was uh, not to be seen anywhere. I looked for it, but I didn't find it anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how hard you're looking, but <laughs> I imagine, I imagine. I, I'm so pleasantly surprised, actually, how good the English levels of people here, maybe because I'm in Lisbon and obviously there's a big touristic area, but I'm pleasantly surprised. I haven't had to use my terrible Portuguese yet too much. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned Portuguese because one of the many languages that our book Make It Stick has been translated into is Brazilian Portuguese, which I imagine mm. is different than Portuguese Portuguese. Oh yeah, know. careful. They might, uh, <laughs> as soon as you think that it's the same type of Portuguese, the, the people here will, <laughs> won't be too happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's cool though. So it's pretty popular in Brazil. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it is popular in Brazil. It's, 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 uh, the book's actually done extremely well worldwide. So it's in many different languages and and uh, it's been fun to watch. Yeah, no, I can see why. I mean, I think anyone that has a growth mindset that's looking to improve is always trying to find new ways to optimize their time when they're learning something. And obviously this is a field that you have a lot of expertise on, but uh, you know, when you were first writing this book, um, I'm sure you've probably spoken to a lot of people, but what, what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding people have about learning? Okay, uh, maybe I could just start by introducing the book. It's called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. Right. It was published by Harvard University Press. Uh, I wrote the book with two cognitive psychologists at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And uh, their field is memory and learning. And uh, the research into learning uh, has been very fruitful in the last couple of decades. And so what we were trying to put out was a book that revealed uh, how learning, successful learning works and that is different from our intuition. Uh, so to your first question, I think that intuitively we're drawn to rereading and reviewing things and trying to burn it into memory. And that sense that uh, studying by cramming or repeatedly exposing ourselves to something is what builds learning. And uh, it turns out from the science that what builds learning is trying to draw out of your brain the information that you've read and ask yourself, how does it connect to what I already know? To begin to knit the connections in the mind between the new material and what you already have there. And to do that effort uh, of retrieving it, of recalling it from time to time, but when it's a little difficult, do it again. And that makes it much easier to find again later. And it connects it to things that you've learned since. So I think what, that's a huge thing. It feels awkward, uh, but it, it really uh, is highly effective. Yeah, can you, can you give an example? I'm assuming that most people, when they think about learning, it's about just cramming in new information and hoping that it just kind of sticks through. And But you're saying it's really more about connecting the previous info with the new info. And uh, maybe a, a slight example would be helpful. Sure. Well, a very simple example. Let's say you're having your breakfast, you're reading something on the uh, internet that's interesting to you and you want to remember to talk to your pal at lunch about it and uh, so uh, you say I'm this is great I want to remember to talk to 
Sam or Sally about this and off you go. And when it comes to lunchtime, you, you know, you say, I read this really great thing. Uh, you should read it. Well, what did you like about it? Well, let's see. You know, it's a little hard to remember the specifics of it. So when you read that, uh, just look away from it and ask yourself, what was it about this? What are the three ideas or something like that that make you uh, think that Sally should read this piece and why? just that idea of looking away and asking yourself, going back and looking again, oh yeah, it's these are the things. That simple act will enable you to go to lunch and say, well, there were three things that I really like, this, this, and this. I think they connect to these other things that we're doing or that we're thinking about or that we care about. So that's, you think when you've read it, you've got it, uh, but it isn't until you've really asked yourself to bring it back up and explain it that you're likely to hang on to it and, and do it. That's a very simple thing, but it's true uh, all the way through the, the realm of learning, whether it's motor skills or intellectual material, uh, the further you go uh, into the complexity, uh, the uh, more you depend on these connections in the mind that you've built through this retrieval practice and yeah. uh, elaboration. Yeah, this is one of the questions I had for you, actually, which is, um, are you familiar with the learning pyramid? Yeah, sure. Uh, boom, uh, the, the Bloom's taxonomy of learning, where you go up and from just memorization at the bottom to being able to apply it, synthesize uh, at the top. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure people have, uh, if people have heard it, but it's, I think it's something like you remember, it's, it, it, it counts the amount of information you retain after 24 hours by different styles of learning. And I think it says something around 10% of things that you read, you can remember after 24 hours, 20% if it's visual, uh, I think 50% if you're doing like group participation, but it's 70 to 90% of things that you immerse yourself in or that you teach others. Yeah. And I've heard some controversy around this. Like some people have refuted this. Like if you type the learning pyramid on Google, there's a lot of articles that support it, but there's also articles that refute it. And I'd be curious to know your thoughts around this general premise of what these guys, I think it's called the National Training Laboratories um, from Israel that came up with this study. But curious to know overall, just based on what you've learned about learning, if that fits the you know architect of like how people learn well i haven't seen that particular taxonomy it but it's similar to bloom's taxonomy which in education that makes a distinction between the simple memorization rote kind of memorization and the varying degrees of mastery of the material and your ability to use and apply that material later but uh you're talking more about here as i understand uh the the extent to which you can recall that material uh, at a later date and make use of it. So they're not inconsistent with each other. But yes, here's the thing about memory. It's, it starts out with something you perceive, you hear it, you see it, you read it, uh, and it goes into a part of the brain called it the hippocampus. It's very sort of, they call them traces. It's very uh, sketchy uh, kind of uh, recording of what you've learned. And, uh, if you want to hang on to it, it has to go into other parts of the brain where long-term memory is stored. So let's say there's lots of things in short-term memory. You have a grocery list. You remember there's six things. You go to the grocery store. You're trying to recall what those six are. You, you know, if you're lucky, you do it. And if you're not lucky, you miss one of them. <laughs> That's short-term mm -hmm. memory. It disappears. We need that stuff to disappear. Long-term memory is actually done by the brain over hours or days, typically overnight. Uh, it rehearses the memory, the, 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 it fills in gaps, it connects it to what you already know. If you've ever written a thesis, a paper of some kind, uh, and you go to bed and if you wake up the next day and you look at it again, you know, there's actually a couple of points here. I could distill this down. These are the points. It, you get better at it because your brain has reiterated the material and found the connections and, and worked for you while you're sleeping. 
that they call that consolidation, it's consolidation of new learning in the other parts of the brain. So this notion of uh, retrieving it, uh, one thing retrieving it from memory does is it ties a knot. I use in the book, Make It Stick, the metaphor of uh, stitching a thread through a lot of cranberries and going to hang them on a tree for decoration and they start falling off the other end <laughs> is because you don't have a knot. If you think of, uh, of a necklace with beads, it's the knots between the beads that hold it. Or you think of a tapestry that shows a medieval scene with horses and nobility and so forth. It's all those knots and retrieval practice, retrieving something from memory ties the knot, it, it, it slows and interrupts really basically the forgetting, which is the human condition forgetting. And uh, so that's one thing that happens when you retrieve it. And the other is over time, when you've encountered related material, you're lighting up the pathways between the neurons where this knowledge is, and it's getting connected to other stuff. So memory is not only do you need to have it in there, but you need to have cues to find it again later. Mm. Uh, if you're trying to recall a conversation you had at lunch with Sally, you know, sometime later, uh, if you can remember the place you were at, the, begin the conversation begins to flood back because there's a little visual cue there that helps light that part of the brain up. Mm. So what I understand you're saying from the national training labs about memory uh, uh, seems to reflect very much what the cognitive scientists have found about how embedding new knowledge and connecting it and coming back to it and building on it, um, creating mental models uh, is what really increases your mental abilities uh, uh, to deal with knowledge or sports, uh, you know, your tennis or your golf putt, uh, your mountain biking activity, all that those experiences build on earlier experiences and soon get chunked together into reflexive activities that you don't even have to think about because mm. you've had that much experience using it and connecting it to new experiences. So, so at a high level, if I'm like reading something, if I'm reading a book, let's say, and I want to be able to remember more information is, is, this, is it a sound strategy to think about a person that I want to explain this to or someone that I want to teach this to and figure out what are the simple ways, as you mentioned, three things that I could teach from what I've just listened to or, or, or read in the book? I think uh, a good way to read a book, <clears throat> other than, uh, say, a novel you're just strictly reading for pleasure, is to ask yourself, you know, what am I looking for in this book? Uh, if it's a book that has <clears throat> test questions at the end of each chapter, you should start by looking at the test questions because that's what you want to be looking for when you read it. Uh, so uh, if you're listening to a lecture or you're reading a book and taking notes, a good way to take notes is to write the questions down that you want to be able to answer instead of writing the answers down and then going back and asking those questions. And then if you can't come up with the answer, go look it up again in the book. Uh, that, uh, those are ways to focus the reading around the jewels, the key ideas that you want to have and your ability to relate them to what's relevant to the person you're talking to or to your own experience. Hey, Peter, one of the things you mentioned before is that it's important to remove the short term things in your memory. And I want to touch on that a little bit because I've always thought for the longest time that I had short term memory issues because, and I think a lot of people feel this, like you think about what you want for the grocery stores, you get to the grocery stores and you realize that you forgot half of the things that you wanted to go in there for. And I, you know, attributed that to like COVID like a couple of years ago and all of these different things that I've just found to be, but I've always had really good long-term memory. And I'd be curious to know like, what is it about removing the short-term memories that's so important for our brains? Like what, what is the function of that? Well, it's like uh, cleaning a closet. I mean, I don't use this shirt anymore. I'll get rid of it. It's always in the way. The brain winnows stuff 
uh, that that you don't need. Uh, so that's important. I mean, the brain has, as far as we know, no limit to its capacity to add new knowledge, but uh, you want to not be distracted by superfluous stuff. Now, there's not much you can do about that except to go through the work of understanding what the main ideas are and the other stuff will, the brain will just let it go. The grocery store trips different from uh, learning microsurgery. The grocery store trip, you only want it for a little bit of time. And uh, there are hacks you can use for that. Uh, simple mnemonics where you take the, if you have a list of six things, you know, look at the first letter and make a little, a word out of that. And then when you get to the grocery store and you go through that word, oh yeah, what was that P for? P, P, oh, pears, I wanted to get pears. Those kinds of things help you with organizing and access to short-term memory. You can also use that for long-term stuff, but uh, the difference between short-term and long-term is we don't really want to invest a whole lot of energy in the short-term stuff if we don't have mm. to. Yeah. So you're saying when someone does have these issues, I want I don't want to say issues, but uh, a, a frequency, a very commonality of like just forgetting stuff in the short term. That's just our brains trying to save energy so that we can continue to function, basically, right? And there's, I think there's some of that, but there's also just the distractions of modern life. Yeah. Your uh, attention is being torn in many different ways, and so uh, if you want to anchor something thing for a little while to make that trip to the grocery or to have a conversation at lunch, you need to pay attention to what it is and quiz yourself a little bit or create a mnemonic in which you can bring up uh, some cues to find it. But uh, the sort of scattered quality we have in our lives these days, uh, is sort of this endless browsing kind of thing, um, stuff goes in and stuff goes out. And so you have to be, be paying attention to the things you want to hang on to either short term or long term. Has there been any studies or research around how meditation can help improve short term memory? Because you mentioned focus and being in the moment when you're in that setting. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with research into meditation. I believe there's probably quite a bit out there. Um, uh, uh, there is this search engine, Google Scholar. Google Scholar, S-C-H-O-L-A-R. If you go to Google Scholar and you uh, bring up a subject like meditation, it will look for uh, scholarly papers, research studies that have been published that include that, that word. Mm. And that's a place you can go to to kind of browse through the literature uh, from science uh, in a topic like that or many other topics, very useful. I didn't know about it till I was working on the project with these scientists and I, <clears throat> I found it at various times in my life very helpful to go ask, you know, you ask a question like, what's the research into meditation? Go to Google Scholar and, and read it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've always wondered um, if, if, if like just being focused more in that moment. I, I would imagine that it's probably the case if meditation does help you stay more focused, but I've also seen like different learning styles um, help with certain other people. So like for me, when I'm writing things down, I tend to remember things much more, but I know some people are much more auditory learners. Um, how can someone actually figure out well, I guess number one, is there a truth to that? Like, is it do some people just learn better in different ways? Visual learners, auditory learners, uh, people that read maybe can can acquire more information. And how does one um, and should one just stick to that if they're trying to learn something new and play to their advantage? Well, it's kind of a personal question. Uh, from a scientific standpoint, the scientists have looked at all the research into the learning styles theory, uh, it looked at studies and how the studies have been performed. And the assumption being, uh, let's say you think you're an auditory learner. Is there research that shows that you learn something better uh, through an auditory presentation uh, and less well through another presentation? And the fact is there's not a, 
a credible body of research that shows that. We write about that and make it stick. Um, in, uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot of different material on learning styles and the research doesn't support that. Now it's clear that there are learning preferences. Some people much prefer to learn something visually or, or auditorily or kinetically. If that uh, affects your ability and your willingness to spend time at something, then yeah, maybe you will learn it better uh, if you do it mm. in the manner in which you prefer to do it. But uh, research uh, does show the best way to uh, teach um, modern art uh, appreciation is visually, and the best way to uh, learn music is orally. Uh, so uh, fitting the content to the delivery method is more effective than Got it. worrying about a learning style being an in inhibition. Got it. Okay. Yeah, th that totally makes sense. So it's, it's less about fitting your personal learning style and saying that you're a visual learner and assuming that you should focus on visual learning for everything you learn and, apply, and applying a one size fits all. It's really more about the context. So you need to be able to adjust and adapt depending on what it is that you're learning at the same time. Right. And I'd like to just say a word about difficulty. Yeah. Um, so the scientists have coined this phrase called desirable difficulty. There are some difficulties in learning that are advantageous. They're desirable. They don't feel good. So trying to re retrieve something from memory that you're rusty at, that's kind of hard to do. You might get it wrong. You don't like doing that. You'd rather review the notes and try to burn it in because then you feel like you're doing something. Um, when you're practicing uh, something like finding the volumes of geometric solids, you'd rather find the volumes of 15 uh, cones because uh, you kind of know what the formula is and then do uh, 15 spheroids and so forth. The research shows if you mix up those practices, each time you get a new example of a, of a, a geometric solid, you have to recall what uh, is the formula? Oh yeah, it's this one and then apply it. You don't do as well during practice. It's hard, it's difficult, you just don't like it. But if you're tested a week later, you do, you do way better than those who did it in a blocked fashion. So that's a desirable difficulty is mixing up your practice of related material. You get better at identifying the, correctly the problem and picking the right solution and applying it. Um, yeah. Spacing out learning uh, makes it a little more difficult. So we have to change the way we think about difficulty. You talked about growth mindset uh, when yeah. we started chatting. And a growth mindset is one where you understand that learning is difficult, that you are creating new connections in the brain, that you have the power uh, to improve your intellectual abilities th through trial and error, trying something, learning from the error, and then trying a different way and getting it right. That's a highly effective way of learning. But people who are afraid of making mistakes or afraid of difficulty uh, or find difficulty means they're not up to it, um, shy away from that and uh, but the best strategies are to go right into that and and uh, deal with that yeah no it's a great point i mean i think it touches on something deeper than the surfaces of tactics and tips around learning that a lot of people tend to focus on but it's really the inner work that you need to go through because anything that you learn you're going to go through these difficult journeys like i i remember feeling very self-conscious in high school, university, thinking that people were far smarter or, or, or faster learners than me, especially because I had a language barrier growing up in Canada when I, when I moved over from Korea. And I've always had that like, um, in, like almost like this inferiority complex, but it wasn't until I developed that mindset with particular like, or, you know, Carol Dweck's book, which I recommend um, just knowing that, oh, like what, I know today isn't going to be limited to what I can learn. I think that's a really important point. How do you think people can develop something of a growth mindset if maybe they don't have that mindset? It's kind of the million dollar question, right? Yeah, I think uh, here's what, where I am on this. So we know from the cognitive science how learning works and it involves these strategies that are somewhat difficult. We also know that in the typical classroom um, for example, you've got someone at a podium or a blackboard and you're sitting there and you're listening. What we need to have instead of that is this kind of active engagement uh, where you sit around with some other uh, learners 
and you say, well, this is the problem. How are we going to tackle this? What would you do? How would we do that? And you create your own understanding of the new material and you make a mistake and you say, hmm, why did that happen? Let's try this. Oh, look, it worked. Um, that, um, that's a long way of saying we need to think about our work in learning like we do in sports where we have a coach. Where we are, a coach doesn't run the moves, you run them, and then you get some corrective feedback. You get someone helping you try things, find the ways that work, and then in, you know, bringing them into your body of knowledge. So I put a lot of the, a lot of the responsibility on uh, how we structure our education systems to help students understand we're talking about learning. <laughs> Teaching sounds like something you can transform, you know, knowledge into someone's head, but really it's the student has to learn it. And uh, we need to focus on learning and how to help that happen as opposed to being passive receptacles of things that come to us from lectures or podcasts or what have you. <laughs> yeah, I just find it whole, I just find it so ironic that oftentimes it's the person that's teaching that's acquiring more knowledge and retaining more information right. and it always seems like if you're the student it's like almost selfish because you're the only one acquiring information but it's um if, especially if you don't know it it's actually teaching that helps you out more and i highly encourage people to teach more it's it's uh it's, it's quite profound actually um i, I want to just shift into learning new skills and for someone that's maybe learning an instrument or a language or learning how to cook, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's, you know, the 10,000 hour rule that he's popularized. Is that really the, well, I guess, what are your thoughts on that 10,000 hour rule? Does it take 10,000 hours to achieve the, the mastery that he's claiming it does? Well, 10,000 hours is a, uh you know, a concept uh, that basically is saying we, not, we need to dedicate a lot of time to something we want to do well. And uh, in his 10,000 hours, it's not just 10,000 hours of exposure to something, it's 10,000 hours of really working at, you know, getting it in and perfecting it, if it's musical uh, instrument or what have you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there, I don't, what the science shows about how learning works is very consistent with the notion of dedicating dedicated practice to mastering something. And uh, so it's about uh, how you study or how you practice uh, and uh, the amount of time uh, I, is clearly a factor for becoming highly competent at some things like, you know, playing a violin or what have you. Um, but it's, it's really the quality or the type of practice that you're engaging in that will make the difference. So I'm not sure exactly whether that answers your question, but it, it, it holds up. Yeah. So I guess um, let's set aside strategy. Let's set aside the styles. Let's say both people are learning the same styles, but one decides to take one lesson of piano lessons per week, but they do it over five years and they hit, you know, 5,000, 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. But if someone decided to do that in one year and decided to take four or five lessons, but they still do it in the same amount of, they still put in the same amount of hours, they just did it shorter and more intensely. What do you think will have a stronger outcome if someone is trying to learn something? Is there something to intensity that helps out? Uh, well, pro probably there is, but there, one of the things that's important is to space out your learning of something. So instead of doing it in a short period of time, do some now, do some next week or do something next month, try it to come back to it uh, because that brings that earlier experience and learning and pulls it forward. You've learned stuff since then, it gets more complex, more sophisticated understanding. Uh, the connections in your brain get stronger. So uh, that's an argument for uh, spacing out and mixing up 
uh, your growth, let's say it's a musical instrument, the different things you're trying to learn along the way, but not leaving behind everything. You want to come back and you want to reach back and do that stuff again, those skills. Yeah. Uh, and that begins to form uh, a number of connections between uh, skills and knowledge that pretty soon become what the scientists call chunked. Uh, it's something you know that you, you don't have to think about anymore. And when you start mm -hmm. driving a car, you have to think about the mirror and the people coming out before you pull out and you've got to do all these different things. Back when we had clutches, you had to worry about the clutch and the shifter. But after a little while, you don't think about that anymore. You're thinking about what you're going to get at the grocery store, but you're doing all those things. So that kind of uh, complex knowledge or mastery in uh, any field uh, will come to you through that kind of practice that is mixed and spaced out over time. Uh, and the 10,000 hours, part of what Malcolm Gladwell is talking about there is the when you form a new memory, uh, uh, one of the neurons in the brain sends out an axon to other neurons and makes a connection. And uh, you can see that on a, uh, in America on a Nova uh, TV show, uh, science show on public television where Eric Kandel, a, a, a scientist, shows that happening under the microscope with a sea slug. It's a physical change. And uh, the more often that that axon is used, uh, the thicker the myelin or wrapping around it becomes, the sheath around it, and the thicker th sheaths uh, make that signal go faster. And so if you do, uh, if you look at the brains of highly accomplished musicians, let's say a pianist, um, uh, after the pianist has passed away and they do uh, an examination of the brain, the parts of the brain that relate to playing the piano will have a much thicker myelin on them than the other parts of the brain. So that, uh, that amount of practice and performance uh, increases the use of those neurons and the connections and increases the speed with which the brain signals go to those places. Uh, so 10,000 hours, I mean, I would, I would say 10,000 hours is a perfectly credible argument from uh, what I understand about how learning works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's people that, you know, try to play the devil's advocate and, and prove that you can have these certain learning shortcuts or hacks to shortcut that to a much less uh, quantity of hours. But what you said about space repetition makes sense if you're trying to follow like a blueprint is similar to building a habit, right? If you're trying to, yes. Yes. you know, now today we don't think about showering or we don't think about brushing our teeth. It's just mm -hmm. built into our memory, but at, mm -hmm. at a certain point it wasn't. And um, I think it goes, it, it, it says a lot. I mean, when we kind of go back to that, I guess, is if we're trying to be ambitious and learn multiple different skills, Let's say you want to learn how to play an instrument, but you also are learning Spanish or, or Portuguese in my case, um, or, and then you are trying to learn a sport. It, are we kind of shooting ourselves in the foot here if we're trying to do all of this at the same time? And is it more similar to what you mentioned about muscle memory or, or habit building, where you want to focus on one thing to the point where you don't have to think about that before you move on to something else? Uh, well, I think it's, I think that we all have a lot more bandwidth than we think we have, but uh, I think the idea is not to be scattershot. So you want to, you know, you want to pay attention to what you're working on uh, in using these strategies of recalling it, explaining it to somebody else, teaching it, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can go out and do something else and apply the same strategies to, to some other activity you've got in mind, but you got to come back to this earlier one. Yeah. And um, so it's a matter of really uh, paying attention to how you are spacing your time of these things that you're learning uh, so that you haven't forgotten what you did earlier. It's a little hard to remember, but you can do it. If you're forgetting it and you have to relearn it, then you're spacing it too far. You may be mixing up too many things. Uh, so if you have, you know, uh, three or four things that you're really trying to focus on, and you can 
come back to them and pick up where you were, but you have to think about it a little bit and recall it uh, and then move on. That's good. Got it. Okay. So there is some validity to perhaps, let's say, learning how to play piano for one, you know, one lesson a week and then mixing it up by learning Portuguese as well. Like those things can actually help. Yeah, I don't know that <clears throat> switching between learning the piano and learning Portuguese helps either one of them. All I'm saying is uh, spacing out your learning of the piano and doing other things in the interim is a good thing, but you mm. don't want it to space so far that you have to relearn what you've learned earlier. So uh, being- What is present, the optimal amount? The optimal amount, there's no a fixed answer to that, but the optimal amount, uh, I'm told by the scientists, is you want to recall it when it's a little harder, a little rusty at it, but you can do it. So as mm. the effort of doing it, it helps light that stuff up in your brain. You don't want to do it in a way that it's rote and your mind actually is thinking about something else because you, you can do it so easily. You know, you want to come back to it and say, oh, what was that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it was this. And then, uh, oh, yeah, and that relates to this other thing. Yeah, okay, I do have it, right? And now let's right. go on go on from there yeah so you want so, to be present in each of those different things you're trying to do and you want to be sure that you're reaching back to the earlier times uh and bringing them forward into the newer uh, period of study or practice mm. yeah so that would depend on what you're learning and what your proficiency is but it should hurt a little it should be like uh it should be a little painful yeah it's where like you're you're in learning portuguese and you're out someplace and uh talking to somebody i know this i spent a year living in italy and i ride my bike a lot and uh, i would stop at uh, each village water pump to fill my water jug and if there was someone there i'd say well what are the hunters shooting you know and i he's i try to understand what these guys were saying to me and maybe to make some notes in my little notebook which i carried with, and then go back and look it up and see if i got it right that kind of um uh, kind of almost random re-encountering uh, thing you're learning is very strong because it mixes up context. Uh, it uh, makes you more versatile in your ability to pull up an idiom or uh, a, a, a fingering movement on the piano uh, and so forth. That's that yeah. mixing and the difficulty is, is great. <laughs> yeah, as long as you it, don't get discouraged. <laughs> Yeah, the growth mindset, right? Uh, that actually reminds me, I, I was like shopping for shoes the other day and I heard this couple fighting over French and I went to Montreal. So I, I, I've learned French, I, my ex-girlfriend was French and I haven't thought about French in about 11 years. That's the thing. And I just not even did thought about it, but I actually understood a good portion of what they were saying. And I was surprised. I was like, that's not Spanish. That's not Portuguese. It's yeah. like French. And it's, it's, um, it was shocking to me that I was able to pick out some of the words that um, I haven't even thought about. And it, it kind of leads me to my question around long-term memory, which is, you know, there are certain memories that we have that are so long, but is there a certain tipping point where it's been um, such a long time where retrieving that information and let's say me learning French again mm -hmm. is going to be much harder because it's been 11 years or should I have picked it up like three years ago or, or five years ago when it hasn't been that long or does it not make much of a difference? Well, I think it makes a difference. I mean, there's no limit to what we can have in our brains that we know of that we've discovered, but uh, the connections to it are fewer perhaps. Uh, I've had the same experience. Uh, in, 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 especially when I was living in Italy of hearing some French people speak and being surprised that my high school and college language was, Fran was French. And when I was trying to learn Italian, my brain kept going to the French words. And it took yeah. me much of that year to have my brain go to the Italian words. And, but then when I heard the French words, you know, as a bystander, well, it's like, I guess I know French better than I thought, right? <laughs> so it depends a little on how recent that, that that learning was and how uh, embedded it was and connected with other things. Some things, you know, like uh, 
uh, the smell of something that you come across will bring flooding back some memories that go back to your childhood right. uh, because they're still there, but you don't normally have the cues to find it. Uh, and so it's partly about cues and it's partly about how well it's connected in there over time, uh, mm. whether, it, whether it stays and whether you re- re- revisit it from time to time. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me to filter out my short-term memory as much as I can so I can make space for this long-term memory that I have. That's my excuse, at least, <laughs> for getting my short-term memory. Um, when it comes to memory, how much does IQ play a role? I mean, I've, I've grown up since childhood about perfecting, especially coming from an Asian family, you know, it's just like, you need this IQ to get into this university. And I never actually taken an IQ test, but it's always been like a conversation people have had around Bill Gates or Warren Buffett and what their IQ was and comparing yourself around this one number and kind of defining how, how smart you are, uh, without even talking about the different types of intelligence, of course, but, um, in your mind, what is like the actual validity of an IQ test and how does it affect um, your ability to remember and learn new things? Does it really play a role? Uh, Obviously it does like at at a hyperbolic level, but like the difference between, you know, certain percentage points. Interesting question. Uh, The IQ of a hundred is what the average person of your age in your area would know. Hey, that's 100. Uh, And if you know more, it's higher than that. If you know less, it's lower. The IQ uh, of in the US today of people who are at 100 would uh, in 1950 uh, would have been rated off the charts because we've had television, we've had movies, we've had travel, we've had uh, the internet now. We know more than people earlier knew. So um, there are things that affect IQ, nutrition uh, in communities, uh, in countries where people drink milk, uh, they get taller and they have uh, higher IQs. But hmm. a, a very interesting study done in, I think it was Brazil, uh, we wrote about it, Make It Stick. Students in a, a elementary school uh, were learning the usual you know, ABCs in elementary school and uh, some other students, um, were, uh, grow, grew up in um, uh, native families and um, they could uh, go into town and they could sell goods. They could do the math associated with changing money and all of that. The, those kids uh, who had a native uh, knowledge uh, couldn't do arithmetic in the classroom the way the class the students who were taught arithmetic in the classroom where you have paper and pencil and all of that. They rated very poorly on an IQ test, but they didn't have a problem with intelligence. They just had a different means in which they were learning. Uh, so IQ is very contextual to uh, yeah. where you are and what you're doing. And uh, I think there's, uh, and, well, there are theories that there are many different kinds of IQ and many different kinds of intelligence. Uh, so I think IQ is uh, a way we can try to judge ourselves whether we're smart or not. And it's, it's unfortunate because <laughs> you get to thinking, well, if this is hard for me, I must not have a very high IQ. Well, maybe it's hard for you because you haven't encountered this before, or maybe it's hard and you're misinterpreting your efforts not succeeding the first time around. Uh, but if you look at what you tried and what happened, it tells you you need to try a little different way and you try a little different way and it works, you're thinking, oh, okay, maybe I'm not so dumb, right? I mean, that's the way life works. It's the way learning works. So I think the emphasis on IQ, I don't know, I said it's a number that may or may not reflect much. Uh, uh, I, after working with a cognitive psychologist, I've come to think, you know, it's a it's a way of thinking about yourself, right? IQ, yeah. am I smart or am I not smart? Well, you know, you can learn. It, it, I I would like students to come out of school saying, I know how learning works. I'm really good at it, 
And I know things are always changing and I can pick up on the new stuff because I know how to learn. So that's much more important than thinking, you know, I'm a little short there, <laughs> too shrimp, short of a boatload or I'm, I'm super smart. Uh, yeah. Not so relevant. Yeah. And I wonder if it's a detriment to certain people that take these tests because whether you score high or not, let's say you score low, now you're going to have this confidence issue of not thinking that you're, you know, the same thing that I had around what you can learn and being inferior to others. And if you have a high score, now you're going to be able to coast. You're thinking, oh, I'm smarter yeah, right. than everyone. And exactly. now I don't need to make much of an effort, but that's just not how success works in life, right? right? Like IQ has really nothing to do with how you succeed in life. And yeah, I wonder if like there should be an updated one around how we can use technology to measure our intelligence and how we can leverage things like Google. Like I know the smartest engineers today are just the best Googlers, you know, because there's so much information out there. It's not about whether you can acquire, whether you can do six, six times 93 in top of your head. It's about how do you leverage existing tools that exist um, that helps you really get there. So uh, as a follow up to that, I, um, I'd be curious to know kind of like what your thoughts are around the current education system in terms of how people are being taught and you know what are some of the things that you would do if you could if someone gave you a magic wand to change not everything obviously like it's it's a big question but to what are some of the some some of the things that um you would change around it I, from what i understand it's still today like the united states is heavily influenced by the prussian education system where like the, the leader, I think Frederick, um, was trying to make the best factory workers and the best soldiers, which influenced this very like um, traditional system that we still are influenced by. Um, but w w what are some of the things that you would encourage or change around how people are learning today? Well, the uh, first thing I would do would be to uh, show the science of how learning works. Uh, if you show some of the charts from uh, the research studies, it's very powerful, uh, the benefits of uh, retrieval practice and spaced learning and mixing practice and so forth. Uh, I spent yesterday an hour on, online with uh, top uh, people at Harvard Medical School, Harvard University Medical School, and they are, totally have changed their curriculum around hmm. uh, this these principles. And um, they get into little arguments about uh, do you need to memorize all this stuff? Well, these days, knowledge is it's a commodity. You can look it up. So it's more about how you think, how you solve problems, uh, how you build uh, uh, a way of problem solving, what your toolkit is for solving problems. Uh, I uh, have worked uh, with a K-12 school, private K-12 school in Minnesota, uh, where uh, we showed the students that video I mentioned about the sea slug forming a memory where, you know, you stimulate it and the axon goes out and connects to another neuron saying, if it feels hard, well, it's because long-term memory is actually a physical change in the brain and you are making those changes. And these kinds of strategies uh, like quizzing and so forth will help you do that. And so they have a whole new vocabulary in that school. It's around learning not about teaching, it's around um, productive failure, if you will, uh, things that, you, that don't work that give you open a door to something that will. So the vocabulary between the instructors and the students, the form in which instruction is given through creative uh, uh, give and take to create your own understanding, conversations with the parents about how to be effective coaches, uh, all of that is uh, flipping in my mind from the idea of teaching to the idea of coaching and learning and uh, helping uh, the individual uh, un understand how to be really effective uh, using the kinds of strategies that will you know, broaden their abilities. So it's big. I think it's really huge work. I mean, we've been in, spent days with the US Naval SEALs uh, training people and they're making changes. It's, I mean, there's the places where this is being done is quite stunning, and the results that they're getting is is really exciting. Uh, we're working on a follow-up book now, uh, 
that talks about how these strategies are being applied and uh, what tips uh, people have for others uh, who uh, want to change the way this is done in their institutions. Uh, it's yeah. very exciting. Do you think do you think that institutions that have kind of followed this path for hundreds of years are they open to making this sort of change after they've seen the facts? <laughs> That's the question of the hour, Sean. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, think, I, just, I just wonder. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the question of the hour. And I, I think that um, they will be. Uh, but you, if you go into a, an institution that's, you know, very solid and uh, kind of hidebound, um, it's going to be a few innovators who lead the way. I mean, the advice that I, I asked this K-12 school, how, what advice do you have for other schools that want to do this? And the answer is, go to the faculty who are the early adopters. They will lead mm -hmm. the way. And uh, I think that's going to be true uh, in uh, throughout. Uh, also, we have faculty in colleges and universities who are lecturers. And they, are, they think they're great lecturers. And they might be great lecturers. But lecturing is not an effective way for other people to learn. Some right. of those maybe need to get into retirement and bring up uh, a newer crop of people who understand how to be coaches and how to go away from the lecture room into the lab and the creative spaces. I think it will yeah. take some time, but the results is that you know, are, are going to really tell the story and the results are really exciting. Yeah. I mean, the, the facts are there. Lecturing as one example is, is, is not the most effective way. And I mean, I think K to 12 will always be the most important part of learning for people that are just developing their brains. But I just question the value of university institutions today, where the value is really meeting people and learning how to learn. But with the pandemic, I think we've seen where everything was going online, where it was just about the learning. I think um, there was a lot of doubts that people had in, in their minds. And I'm hopeful, certainly. Um, but I think there's a lot of research saying that now with automation and AI and all these things being automated, the only real skill left for people today are going to be creativity and the soft skills that universities that are so outdated are just not teaching and are not adapting fast enough. Um, at least most of them aren't. And yeah, I guess it's just something we have to, to wait for. There's a, a chemistry professor at University of Arizona uh, who's led the change there. And he said, let's teach how we think, not what we know. And it's just, they've gone away from the lecture hall and into these uh, small spaces uh, where they, they present a problem. And then they start helping students learn the tools to solve the problem. And the problems that they get get more and more complex, but the tools, they can reach back to these earlier tools, but now there's some new tools. And right. it's a way, it becomes a way of thinking and of problem solving. And yeah. uh, that will never uh, lose the need for that. I think that's what empowers us to have that kind of mental toolkit and to know how to go about uh, working on a problem and solving that problem. Then we know what we, how to search the internet or how to find what other people have done, how to collaborate. Instead yeah. of just trying to build a library of knowledge uh, without the ability to actually use it. Yeah, it's almost that the, like the application of new tools that are going to be arising are, seems to be more important than just learning. For example, before I used to be able to learn how to do like 9 times 17 like in, on top of my head, and it was just a muscle memory that I built. But now you have a calculator on your phone. It's just, I almost got worse with math, like just completely worse. Yeah. And um, I, I worry a little bit, but I realize that in the future, calculators are only going to, it's still going to exist. And I'm just wondering if I'm shifting my, uh, my knowledge set and my skill set to something that's more relevant for, for the modern time. So, um, Peter, this has really been uh, amazing. I'm really grateful that you... Uh, decided to spend some time with us and, and share more about the book, make, make it stick, and um, to share your knowledge about what it really takes for someone to learn and retain more information in today's uh, modern world. Uh, any Anything that you want to leave with us, anything that you want to share? I know you've got a new book that's coming out as well. 
um, any takeaways? That's, that'll be a while. That's still in the works. Uh, but yeah, the book is Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. It's in, I think, 17 languages around the world. It's available audio, physical, ebook, whatever. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk because uh, the, what, what we've learned about learning is really exciting to me and, and to others. And I think that's why the book is, has done so well. Uh, and um, it's a very exciting time to be uh, participating in these things. So I thank you for this opportunity. No, thank you. It's been an honor. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. 